Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to our final panel of the day, Matt de la Pena and Christian Robinson, The World Without and the World Within. Jenny, Christian, and Matt, if you'd turn on your video and audio so we could see you. Hey, Good Christian. Morning. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jenny. Hello. So, Jenny Brown, senior editor of Shelf Awareness, has spent the past 30 years toggling between her two passions, education and bookmaking. She served as director of the Center for Children's Literature, an interim children's librarian at Bank Street College of Education, and as publisher of Kanoff Books for Young Readers. She currently serves on the Bank Street Children's Book Committee and on the board of the Jane Addams Peace Association. When she's not combing bookshelves for her next read, you can find her performing at Don't Tell Mama in New York. Jenny lives with her husband in Hewitt, New Jersey. And now she will introduce her panel, Christian Robinson, Matt De La Pena, The World Without and The World Within. Thank you so much, Cindy. I've been so inspired and energized by all of the conversations this morning already. And it is such an honor to be here today with Matt La Pena and Christian Robinson. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction for each of them and then we'll just jump right in. Matt La Pena is the number one New York Times bestselling and Newbery Medal winning author of Last Stop on Market Street, which was also awarded a Caldecott honor for Christian Robinson's illustrations. Matt is the author of seven young adult novels, including Mexican White Boy and We Were Here, as well as five additional picture books, including Milo Imagines the World, which we'll be focusing on this morning, and which was also illustrated by Christian Robinson. In 2016, Matt was awarded the NCTE Intellectual Freedom Award. Matt received his MFA in Creative Writing from San Diego University and his BA from the University of the Pacific, where he attended school on a full basketball scholarship. In 2019, Matt was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of the Pacific. Christian Robinson is an illustrator, author, animator, and designer based in Oakland, California. He was born in Los Angeles and grew up in a small one bedroom apartment with his brother, two cousins, aunt and grandmother. Drawing became a way to make space for himself and to create the kind of world he wanted to see. He studied animation at the California Institute of the Arts and would later work with the Sesame Workshop and Pixar Animation Studios before becoming an illustrator creator of books for children. The Christian Robinson for Target collection, which released in August 2021, includes more than 70 items across home and apparel for kids and babies. His books include the number one New York Times bestseller, Last Stop on Market Street, which won a Caldecott honor, a Coretta Scott King illustrator honor, and the Newbery Medal for, <clears throat> for Matilda Pena's words, words and the number one New York Times bestseller, The Bench, written by Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. His solo projects include Another, which was named a New York Times Best Illustrated Book of 2019, and the New York Times bestseller, You Matter. This morning, we also heard about his book with Tracy Todd called Nina, A Story of Nina Simone. Christian's latest collaboration with Matt de Pena, Milo Imagines the World, received six starred reviews and was a number one indie bestseller and a New York Times bestseller. He looks forward to one day seeing the Aurora Borealis. Welcome to you both. It's such Thank a you pleasure. So much. It's such a pleasure to have you here. It's good all to see both of you. <laughs> all the way from California. I know. Yes. <laughs> It's early. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. We appreciate you making it here for us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your unusual collaboration style. Um, so many of the publishers kind of try to separate authors and artists. And Matt, you would have written the text. And the next time you'd see mm -hmm. something from the artist might be at the sketch stage. And Am I right, Christian, that your process was a little bit more collaborative? And could the two of you talk a little bit about how you work together? Yes, um, it's certainly more collaborative. Actually, I'm gonna start this thing off with some visuals because um, that's how my brain works and it helps me also keep on track. <laughs> uh, so I think I have screen sharing capabilities. Um, so let me see, share a screen. Yes, and then share. 
and everyone can see that. Yeah. Yep. So yes. Okay. And let me enter full screen. Yeah. So yeah, Matt and I, we met through our shared agent. Um, and it, and from the very beginning, it almost felt like uh, our agent Steve was working on a way for us to work together, to collaborate. Um, and so Steve found me, our agent, through this blog that I used to keep. Um, this was years ago. I would just like post anything I was working on, any creative project. I used to work with kids doing after school art. That was one of the projects we did. And I made this painting on that blog of me and my grandmother riding the bus. Um, which is what how we got around growing up in LA. We didn't have a car. Um, and our agent Steve saw this painting and thought there was a story here. And you know, in our first conversations, he told me about an author he represents Matt and he'd love to share this with him and and uh, and see if something came up for Matt. And then Matt received this painting and and then Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so this was such an interesting phase in my journey as a writer too because i had only written novels but what a lot of people didn't know at the time and, and our agent knew is i began my writing career pre-publication with spoken word poetry and so poems were always like my home uh writing in verse so when steve showed me this image I had been working <clears throat> at the time on a YA novel with a lot of the themes and ideas that ended up in Last Stop. And it just wasn't working for a YA novel. So I saw this and I saw this incredible possibility for some of the ideas I wanted to, to kind of explore. So I think, first of all, I love the intergenerational aspect of it. The first thing I did in an early draft is impose my own story into this picture. So I put myself on the bus with my grandmother, who's uh, my Mexican grandmother. And I, I sort of told the story from that perspective. But then I met Christian and his grandmother. And there was something so, I don't know, it was so organic about the relationship and the story that I was trying to tell that I, I actually pulled myself and my grandmother out and sort of kind of bent toward Christian's actual story. Um, and then, yeah, later it became Last Stop. And when we were, well, with Last Stop, we didn't communicate as much, to be honest, because we still didn't really know each other. <laughs> yep, that's true. <laughs> um, but after last stop, yeah, we we both like would just text every now and then whenever a question would come up for me as I was illustrating, um, or even just thinking of what sort of thing we'd want to work on next, right? Yep, that's exactly right. I think uh, specifically for Milo, we were on tour for Car Carmela, and you know, for, I think for Carmela, Christian sort of bent toward the story that I was curious about following. And I think um, we were on tour. We had a little time to kill before our event. And we were like, what would we want to do next? And so we, we batted a couple ideas around back and forth. And I think Christian at some point in the conversation said, I've always wondered when it would be time to tell the story of how I grew up um, with an incarcerated mother. And it almost seemed like he was inviting me to try to to participate in that part of his, his story. And I got really excited. What Kristen didn't know is I had YA novels that dealt with you know the criminal justice system, the group home system. So I was super excited to try this in, in a picture book. So it, I got really excited. I think we stopped talking about it. I disappeared for six months. And then I think, Christian, you got the manuscript. Isn't that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And Matt, you're remembering correctly. Yeah, we were in some cafe somewhere on tour with Carmela, and um, you asked what I was thinking about us working on next, and I hesitated to tell you because I thought maybe one day I want to tell the story of like what it was like growing up with a, an incarcerated parent. 
Um, but that thought quickly disappeared because I knew that I trusted Matt as a storyteller and I knew that I trusted his ability to take the story and take it places I couldn't have. Um, um, and yeah, I just, and yeah, I, yeah. Yes. And I think you also knew this wasn't the only opportunity to tell that story, right? So down the road, you may do something else with that, that part of your, your background, right? Uh, I, I would love to share one other thing about our process. So Christian talked about how we sometimes text. You know, sometimes we're talking about being on the road or, you know, the, the tribulations of being, you know, in airports all the time. But every once in a while, when he has a manuscript that I've worked on, he will send me a text that's a question. And it will be like a tiny detail. Like for this book, I remember Christian said, Matt, what's going on with this line? She had a face made out of light. And then I wrote Christian this probably 1500 word answer on text. It just went on and on and on. And I know now with working with Christian, he will just send me like a one word response to that massive essay that I wrote him. But I, I love that because he's just sort of taking in my thoughts. And then of course he turns to his own storytelling um, strategies and, and thinking, and it comes out the way it, it comes out. And I think his question is targeted to something he's trying to do. I don't have that knowledge. So I just tell him all the stuff I'm thinking about with that line. And probably it's way too much information, but I love that part of our process. And then I truly get his response to my text in a sketch form or in the final art, which is really cool. Yeah. Christian, um, Christian mm -hmm. may I just interject? I'm looking at this wonderful image of the inside of the subway train and it is reminding me that I was mm. on a subway a couple weeks ago in New York City and I thought of that image because there were performers on the subway mm. you just make it so vibrant and wonderful forgive me go ahead Christian yeah um thank you um uh what was I gonna share um and I took capturing the spirit of the subway very seriously, even mm. though I grew up um, on the West Coast um, and we, I mostly just rode the, the bus. Um, you know, I've been to New York a few times, but yeah, and I, you know, I try to, I think I just kind of took in the spirit of just riding public transportation or what that experience feels like. But I also, I don't know if I have slides of it. Let me see if I do. Um, I spent a lot of time in the library uh, in San Francisco at the time, uh, just looking at um, the, the art, the design, the graphics uh, that make the New York subway system. And there's a lot of books out there on it. And so I was just, it just took me to another level of just inspiration and excitement um, about this book. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there are like so many stories on the subway and <clears throat> on, on public transportation in general. And Christian and I both love to set stories in the world of public transportation. And, and here's an interesting idea I was thinking about um, in terms of Milo. Sometimes working class people are pushed closer together with fellow community members. And sometimes when your wealth grows, it allows you to have more distance from your community and you have more space. So sometimes what is lost in that process is you lose a little bit of touch with community. One of the things I love about New York as opposed to California, in California, if you're on the bus, you're probably working class. But in New York City, you could be a banker sitting next to somebody who cleans that office space. and I. I love that com the community is pushed together. Um, I think on the subway, you always see people trying to carve out their own individual space by reading a book, reading a magazine, um, playing a game. Um, now you can, you can actually answer emails because the internet, you know, you have internet access between stops. But if you look up instead of looking at a device, 
you will see so many stories that are just waiting for you to like wrestle them into, you know, a text. What I used to do when I lived in New York for, for 15 years is I would ride the subway, I'd have headphones on, I'd have a book. But if somebody was having an interesting conversation, uh, like any good stalker, I would just turn the music all the way down so that, you know, it didn't look like I was listening in, but I would sometimes record the dialogue I heard because it was, I would hear incredible things. So I, I love the subway as a, as a setting for story. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting what you say too, Matt, because I, I found that on the buses in New York, you can actually hear more of those conversations because people are carving out the space on the subway, as you mentioned. Yeah. So it was interesting to me to look at these two books side by side in that context and the kinds of interactions that people have on the bus in Last Stop on Market Street and then on the train in Milo Imagines the World. But Christian, you looked like you were about to say something. Um, not, not, well, okay, sort of, yes. I was gonna <laughs> say just like, I, I distinctly remember just always being overwhelmed when I was on the New York subway because I'm not good at tuning things out. So I'm involved in every single conversation. And I'm like, with a friend, I'm like, did you just hear what she said on the phone? Did you hear what they're doing? Oh my God, they're going through a really bad relationship situation right now. And my friend's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, so it can be overwhelming, but yeah. Well, I'm impressed at how well you were able to capture the New York subway, Christian, if you haven't had as many interactions with it as, as you've said. Um, you know, speaking of, modes of transport in, in Last Up on Market Street and in Milo Imagines the World, our heroes, CJ and Milo, both undertake a journey. And by the end, you've, they've each changed profoundly. And I wondered um, if the two of you kind of started with the idea of a hero's journey for, for each of the books, or is that something that evolved because of where you wanted to take readers? Can you just say a little bit about how those evolved? Sure. Um, for me, you know, I'm very familiar <clears throat> with the hero's journey, but I have to like, this is my process, but I have to divorce myself from that structure when I tell a story, because then it feels a little too mechanical if I'm trying to plug things into that journey um, or into that structure. So I think for me, it's more important to follow the characters and follow the community that they're within. Um, because there's a great line uh, that is applied to playwriting. And I, I can't remember who said it, but she said, when you're writing a scene for a play, always leave a door open because you never know who's gonna walk in. And I think the more you abide by a structure, like the hero's journey, the less open you are <laughs> to interesting turns. And so, so I love, um, just following character. And then one, one more thing I'd love to add on that is sometimes the exterior of the character can suggest the interior of the character. I think there's a phrase for that, like objective correlative, where yes, there's a, there's a journey physically happening where the characters are literally moving through the city, either underground or, or above ground, but it's reflecting that there's some sense of movement inside of the characters. And so I think that's more my guide. It's visually interesting to have movement, but it also is suggestive of that interior movement, which, which is like my favorite part of storytelling, finding a way to move a character on the inside, even just a little bit, I think that's worthy of a book. That's wonderful. Christian, do you have any thoughts about the, the visual structure as you were thinking about creating these two books? Um, yeah, um, so Matt gave me, I guess, a big opportunity to, um, <clears throat> to add to that storytelling in the, inter the internal storytelling uh, by deciding how to visualize Milo's imagination. Um, and I had no idea how I was going to go about <laughs> doing it initially. Um, I thought maybe, you know, the world that he imagined in the story could just be 
the same as the illustrations that we see throughout. Um, uh, but then uh, I'm always looking for an angle of just like fun for myself. It's, it's selfish. What is the way I'm gonna have the most fun illustrating this book? Um, and showing Milo's internal world through his sketches made the most sense to me. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get to those slides, but yeah, and it, and it gave me it gave me a chance to show his world and also add to the storytelling. Um, so yeah, his internal sketches, and it was fun to just kind of play around with this more simplistic, playful style. Um, and uh, yeah, can I add something? Um, so. I think when you've worked together, this is our third time working together, you start to understand, I guess, I, I hate to do a sports analogy on the, the Bank Street Conference here, but like it's almost like you can become a point guard in a basketball game where you're putting your teammates in the best position to succeed or to score. So now I, I know where Christian, you know, is, you know, I know where his greatest talents are, you know, or at least some of them. And so it was so fun to try to place Christian in a spot where he could do something, you know, that was interesting to him, eh? but also uh, that he could kind of like spread his wings a little bit, you know? So part of my process as a picture book writer is knowing where to leave even more space for the talented illustrator I get to work with. Um, and I think, when Milo is, is kind of imagining things, and we see on the screen right here that you know part of the picture is realistic, but part of it is the way Milo's imagining it, what we're actually seeing is Milo's psychology at work. We all know, if we've read the book, that he's going to visit his mother who's incarcerated. So if you look at all of his imaginative moments where the art changes into his mind, it's really him processing where his mom is and what his reality is. You'll see that there's a form of emancipation in, in many of the drawings. There's a form of un trying to comprehend what it means to be wealthy, like the kid with the, the, the nice shoes, because Maybe he lives in a castle where a drawbridge door is going to close to protect all his cool stuff from other people. So it's, it's very interesting to chart his psychology. And really, that is what Christian brought to the story is like, I put him in a position to explore the psychology of, of Milo. And you know, Matt, I want to just follow up on something you talked about with the interior versus exterior. Uh -huh. um, Christian, if you wouldn't mind going back a couple slides where to show that sort of split screen image between Milo and the white boy with the nice shoes, um, because he has, Milo has thoughts about this boy. And, you know, Matt was talking about how the subway kind of throws everyone together, regardless of class. And, you know, these two individuals are looking at each other and thinking whatever they're thinking, but it all turns out to be very different from what Milo first talks about. And I just wondered, Christian, if you could talk about a little bit how you kind of set that up for readers so that we're going on this journey with Milo of, you know, rethinking what we might've originally thought about someone. Mm. So, yeah, okay. First off, um, I don't. I know. I know. Matt and I haven't spoke, talked about this book in a hot minute, so I know I'm <laughs> like rusty as like is a really rusty. Um, but Baldwin, my dog, is here to help me out. Oh, look at that! Uh, oh my goodness, that's a nice <laughs> Baldwin. Oh, he likes it when I rub his ear. Okay. Um, <laughs> back to the question. Um, so it was really interesting when I was working on this. I had to like trick my own brain. So I had to like think of like, what are stereotypes? And then how can I break them? And then so I had to like show people and characters that could like represent 
certain, like that we might put into a box and think a certain way about them, but then figure out how I'm gonna, is it deconstruct that, break that apart, challenge that, um, which was fun. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm losing. Well, I'm losing this is an interesting. Yeah, worry, this yeah. is an interesting moment, right, Christian? Um, first of all, I I don't think we've ever actually talked specifically about this picture, and I I've always loved the way you set this up, and you know sometimes young people I feel like you look at each other, and you don't know each other, and all you have to go on is surface things, right? You don't know the story behind the face you're looking at. But you almost frame your own life sometimes in looking at someone else. And, and so that's why I loved that we got to see both of them. It wasn't a, an image where it was from the side and we saw them both looking at each other. We actually got to see both of their faces as they look at each other. And this just, I, I got to be honest, this takes me back to my childhood when I would compare my life to some kids who I thought had more than me. And I would actively kind of build walls around my possibilities. And I don't know, Kristen, did you, what made you put them both like right on top of each other like this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> to be honest, um, it's all, it's a, some of it's intuitive. Yeah. I'm just kind of just going with my gut with what feels right. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I don't even know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said just now, I think I totally went back to experiences of my childhood. It's, um, and it's, I mean, all I remember doing all the time was constantly repair, comparing myself. I can mm -hmm. only imagine what young people are going through today with yeah. social media and, and the internet. But yeah, that is um, what I constantly remember doing um, and, and much like Milo, there were, there were lots of moments in life where those, um, uh, quick judgments were challenged. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for people who haven't maybe had a chance to read the whole book, these <clears throat> two boys end up in the same place. Um, and that's really what's so striking to me about this image that they, whatever thoughts they might have about each other, they don't realize how similar their experiences actually are, you know, the, the sort of core of the heart experiences. Um, and I'm just going to move a little bit into talking about both of your books, because um, there's an image that I love, and I don't know if you can see it if I hold it up, but Christian, maybe you have an image of this that's better. Um, this is an image from Last Stop on Market Street, in which um, CJ is looking out the window. Can everybody see that? Um, <laughs> you do have it, Christian. Perfect. I may, I might not have that exactly. Okay. Not have it. okay. Um, but if you can see <laughs> CJ looking out the window of the bus here, and then we have an image of Milo looking out the subway window and he sees himself. Um, I was really struck by these two images because both boys are having this inner journey as you so beautifully put it, Matt. Um, and they're, they're starting to rethink how they have always thought about the world. And I just wondered um, if either of you thought about the fact that there is this kind of similar moment for the two boys, or if that was just something that evolved, because it's in the text as much as it's in the images. This is, by the way, maybe the most interesting question I've ever received about these books. Like that's such a thoughtful um, comparison, the way to frame the two books. I think when I look at that, um, the, the moment comes early for CJ because he's looking out the window and he's sort of, <clears throat> he's, he's uninterested in the journey he's about to take. What he doesn't know is the journey of the book outside of him, beyond him, is that, 
you know, his grandmother is trying to show him to see the show, teach him how to see the beauty in his community as a way to see himself as beautiful. Whereas Milo, this is a little deeper into the story. So it's a little further along in his interior journey. And I think he's, he's got a reflective window. And so it helps him look inside. And I think the biggest thing that he's trying to think about in that moment, and I wonder how Christian thought about this, but he's, he's making these judgments based on kind of surface details, face, clothes, um, expression. And he's, he's wondering what people see inside him. And of course, this comes right on the heels of him imagining the dancers who, who maybe are going, going to be, um, there's going to be some, oh gosh, what are those things called <laughs> where it's like a microaggression or whatever, where somebody follows you because of how you look in a store to make sure you don't steal because you fit the profiling. description. Maybe. What's that? Profiling them? Yeah, they're being profiled, right? And this makes him feel uncomfortable. And he starts to think about his mom and where she is. And he starts to think about how do people look at him? <clears throat> and of course, we could all do this where we look in the mirror and wonder how people see us. And of course, what really makes Milo Milo is that he read a volcano poem to his class and that his mom is conscientious enough to read him a bedtime book over the phone. And he loves the food his, his auntie makes. So they're very simple, specific things that make up who he is. So this is a very first step of what ultimately becomes him reimagining all the snap judgments he made about the characters. Whereas CJ, he's still early in his journey and he's looking out and wishing he was somewhere else and maybe not on this interior exterior journey i don't know what how would you respond to that christian whoa <laughs> <laughs> and also you're making me think about i feel like right now if we're <clears throat> gonna get personal i'm in a place in my life where i'm unpacking so much of what you just talked about um growing up a young black boy um i remember from an early age having a really strong sense of how the world viewed me mm. um, and how I had to conduct myself within it to make other people feel safe and secure. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and so, uh, or I knew that I would all automatically be seen almost like a tr as a troublemaker. And so I, 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 I felt this internalness, this, this desire to show people that um, they're safe in my presence or that I am like gentle and, I, and I'm a good one. Um, and I'm, I imagine I, I was putting, I, was, I know I was feeling all those things when I was illustrating this book um, that Milo may be aware of those judgments that people have on him. And he's, and he's really concerned about it because his security and safety is connected to how people view him. Um, and, uh, and it also makes you resentful of others who may not, you feel, are going through that journey themselves. So again, he sees this young boy and maybe is putting a lot on him about what his life might be like, um, um, but not recognizing also, but later recognizing that they have more in common than he could have imagined. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And you know what, what this brings me to the picture book in general, because I, I love the way you frame that. And I love, especially the way you talked about, you thought it was your job to make others feel comfortable. So you were almost moving through the world, worrying about how others <clears throat> sort of viewed their interactions with you instead of trying to take ownership of a moment. I think that's fascinating, which brings me to the picture book. <clears throat> In a novel, you can make that conscious, right? This can be a conscious arc of a character and you can you can go pretty far with it. With a picture book, what I love is that maybe what you're trying to do is show the, be the very beginning of that journey that's not even conscious yet. You're just like sort of scratching at that 
at that, uh, the beginning of that journey. And that's enough for a picture book. Like CJ, I don't know if next Sunday he's going to be excited to go on the bus and go to the soup kitchen. But in that journey, he's just starting to try to see the world like his grandmother. And maybe this is one of the first times Milo has just begun to, to wonder, is it possible that he's misreading people the way he might be being misread? So I love that about picture books. It doesn't, you don't have to solve the problem. You almost have to just barely locate the problem or the, you know, the beginning of that journey. So I, I love the way you talked about that. Wow, there's so much to digest here. Um, Christian, I really appreciated what you said about how you have to make others feel safe in order for you to feel safe. Um, so that might be something Milo is thinking about. Um, you know, I, CJ and Milo each are artists in their own way. And when CJ hears the rhythm of the guitar player on the bus and he's closing his eyes as the blind man advises him to, and he sees sunset colors swirling over crashing waves. And then Milo sees stories everywhere he looks, imagining the whiskered man in his fifth floor walk up with rats and cats and the boy in the suit, you know, who we've talked about with the scuffless white Nikes riding a horse-drawn carriage to his castle. Um, and then Milo has to revise these scenarios as we've talked about. Um, do you think that all children have that capacity are there things that children have said to you, the two of you, when you've been talking about this book or made appearances and this book has been something that's come up in those conversations? Have children talked to you about having experiences similar to CJ's or Milo's? Do you mean in, in terms of like recognizing what they're seeing or just the imaginative part? Um, I think it could be either. Like maybe okay. they've been moved to think differently about other people as a result of your books or um, that they've shared with you times that they've imagined situations where they, they feel similar to Milo or CJ. Um, yeah, I, I definitely have. Um, I think my favorite thing to do is, is kind of think about the different reactions depending on what community I'm reading these books to. Mm. So it's fascinating if I'm in a predominantly affluent school, maybe a private school, and I read this book, I get, I get like a, uh, like there's a conscious reaction. It's, it's thoughtful. It's, um, it, it's almost a, an examination of the story where and by, I'm talking about by the young students. And if I take this into a Title I school and read it, I get this amazing visceral reaction to these stories and they're feeling their way through it, maybe because they are identifying it. And uh, we are sort of hovering around this, this idea, you know, this windows and mirrors idea by, is it Rudine? Rudine Simmons Bishop. Simmons Bishop, who kind of, came up with this in an article, I believe. But um, so yeah, there's two very different reactions. I have to say one of my favorite things about being a picture book writer and getting to collaborate with artists is going into Title I schools and just seeing that visceral reaction. I think the cool thing about being a kid, two things come to mind. One, you can see the world in fantasy and the realism of the world at the same time, which is incredible. Like I play, uh, I play stuffed animals with my daughter. It's one of my roles as a dad and she's young. She can consciously know that I'm making the voices and yet still believe that the stuffed animals are talking. What an incredible place to be in your life where you can actually hold two realities at once. And so knowing that, I think it gives you a little bit more freedom to take those kind of risks as a storyteller. And then um the other thing that came to mind is just you know i think adults we we've kind of formulated our boxes that we're putting people in and they're strong they almost have a lock on them whereas i don't think kids have that lock yet it's still malleable um whereas 
adults, we read books that reinforce what we already believe. And we seek out those books because it makes you feel good to be like, oh, that's what I think too. I think kids don't know what they think yet. And they're open to all different stories. And when I think about Milo here, you know, because he's young, it's easier for him to reimagine these, these stereotypes that he had placed at the feet of these characters. So that's what comes to mind when you ask that question. Christian, do you have any thoughts in terms of your interactions with kids? Yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, with Milo, we really haven't been able to be on the ground sharing this story, which is, yeah, really difficult. It's really challenging. Um, yeah. um, but for sure, I've, we've, we've, I've received messages, of course, of children who know this experience, who have incarcerated parents or just parents who are away. Um, um, and same, similar with, with Last Stop, it's, it's always just so heartwarming for me and healing for me to hear just the response of, I mean, it's the littlest things I pick up on too. Like, oh, the guy with the tattoos, that looks like my dad. Mm. Oh, the, the, oh, he's, they, it doesn't say that CJ is raised by his grandmother, but you know, there are many kids who are raised by their, a grandmother or an aunt or a sister. So that just means so much to them. And um, yeah, so that, that's just what means the world to me is those connections where people really see their experience reflected. Um, and back to Milo, I, th I think about in my childhood, of course it was challenging not having a, um, you know, your mother or father um, available in your life. I was fortunate to have a grandmother who was our caregiver. Um, but I think what made that experience more challenging than anything was the amount of like shame I held around it, like not being comfortable talking to anyone about it, friends or um, a teacher. Um, and that's, that was the most difficult part. And so for me, it was so important to tell this story in a way that could at least open those conversations um, and let a child having that experience know that their experience exists and is, it matters and they're not the only one going through it. Um, yeah. Can I tell you something I heard, Christian? Um, I was just in, um, I just flew home yesterday. Where was I? Oh, I was in a Pennsylvania uh, town and I read Milo and a teacher told me something just that blew me away. She said she had her, her class that hadn't been together in so long, of course, because of the pandemic, but now they're in person again. They read Milo and um, she said one little girl um, third grade class, kind of during the book, there were questions about where they were going and what the metal detector was. And the teacher told me that in that moment, the little girl said, well, here's how it goes and explained what it, what it meant to visit somebody, kind of the, the little things that you have to go through, putting your, your stuff in a bin, like almost like the airport. And everybody turned to her as the expert of this story. Mm -hmm. And she said, she's a student that normally isn't participating. She's kind of off to the side and very quiet. But in this moment, she was the very center of this learning experience. And I just, that, that just makes me feel so happy that kind of what you're talking about. You have experts out there that maybe feel a little bit less shame about it because it's in a book and we still have this strange feeling as kids that if it's in a book it's more true or more important um so that's kind of like that that's the the most amazing part of having this book in the world to me that's so powerful uh, just thinking about this child who suddenly feels like her experience has been validated yeah um you know, I, I wanted to ask a little bit, Matt, about um, because you've moved from novels to picture books, in cooking, we talk about reducing a sauce to boil it down to its essence. And when you work on a picture book text, um, you're pacing an economy of language, get the text to precisely what's <clears throat> needed. Um, can you say a little bit more about, I know you talked a little bit about your poetry background. Can you just talk a little bit about that shift that you make as a novelist? Sure. 
to work on picture books? Yeah, like I love writing novels because I can like make mistakes and I can go down, you know, roads that are, you know, cul-de-sacs and I can go on tangents with uh, conversations. And I kind of have to say there's a freedom in that. But when you are working in a picture book, you cannot take wrong turns. Everything counts and every word counts, but not even every word, every syllable counts. So like I like to make my novel prose musical, but when it comes to a picture book, I think music is as, is as important to the process of writing a picture book as the story. So I'll give you an example. Um, Hopefully I'm not speaking out of school here, but there's a there's a line in Last Stop on Market Street, and I'm going to sound so dramatic right now, so I apologize. But it's uh, it's at the end of the the scene that you you cited where he's closing his eyes and he's seeing the hawks and he's seeing the the butterflies that are free, and at the end it says that CJ was lost in the sound and the sound gave him the feeling of magic. So. I repeat the word sound there, right? The editor at the time, she said, you know, there are a couple tweaks we could make to the language. Here, you repeat the word sound, maybe just take one out. And I looked at her and I was, I nodded and I was like, okay, I could do that. But if I, if I take one of those sounds out, can you just, can you promise me you won't put my name on the book? And she was like, what? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I feel like the whole, music of the book rests on that second sound he's got his eyes closed I feel like I earned that extra beat of rhythm CJ was lost in the sound and the sound gave him the feeling of magic so to me the the music becomes so important and part of making that music and this is getting back to your question is trying to cut away all the syllables, not just the words, but all the syllables that are superfluous or get in the way of the rhythm. I don't love, you know, uh, specific rhyme schemes. Now, I love to read them to my kids, but I don't love to write them, but I do love little interior rhymes. And it, for me, they hold up the text and the story. Um, and for Milo, I, I'll never forget, trying to figure out the voice of the book and then thinking of the subway no. as a living thing. So I remember thinking, okay, what begins as a slow distant glow grows and grows into a tired train. So I loved the glow to grow. And I, so anyways, I think I'm rambling, but you just basically got me talking about my favorite thing about picture books is, which is just, the language and the music and, and I just love it. And this is, this is where I get to make my magic for a picture book and then turn it over to Christian and he makes it hopefully visually magic. And, and that, that's the, the fun part of the process. That's beautiful, Matt. And Christian, I, I wondered if we could dive a little deeper into the visual cues you give to readers in Milo, because you talked about, um, I just thought it was brilliant the way that you sort of frame his drawings and then his drawings sort of bleed out, you know, as we saw on the cover when you showed it. Um, so there is that intermingling of what's real and what's in his head. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you came up with that approach for these illustrations? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, okay. So I, I remember wanting to, I remember not being sure how I was going to go about handling that. Um, and then it, it, it dawned on me, I'd love to show his, his drawings and his sketches and his drawings and his sketches could be what he was imagining. Um, the reality is, growing up, did I ever bring my sketchbook with me when we went places on the bus? Yes, but I would never draw on the bus itself because I took drawing way too serious to like handle the bumps that would happen. But I would maybe draw at the bus stop or something like this. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, I mean, that that's pretty much it. I, I love children's drawings. I love the simplicity of them. It's almost like, um, I think what I love so much about 
kids' drawings. Well, what I try to do as an, as an illustrator is communicate an idea as simply as possible to, so that someone can pick it up really quickly. And what I love about a kid's drawing is they literally can just draw a circle and a triangle and like one whisker and you're like, oh, it's a cat. Um, mm -hmm. It's like they're automatic graphic designers and it's really cool and, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. You know, could I jump in there, Jenny? Um, what, what was fun about this book and partially to honor the fact that this comes from Christian's story is we give Milo the last word. Like we end the book on his drawing and not um, the real world, right? So I, I thought that that was a fun thing for Christian to play with and to figure out what was he gonna do you know, he's got to bring the whole story together now uh, in Milo's drawing. And I, I like that Milo's interior is the last image of the book. Mm -hmm. Which is this spread when he shows his mother um, his drawing in a sketchbook of them together. Um, yeah. I don't think we can see it. Oh, see it. Okay. I'm over here having a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You like, yeah. deserve a moment. You're like, yeah. <laughs> okay, wait, okay, so Zoom's doing something really tricky. Okay, no, my brain, it's too early for me to to un, to figure out what's happening. So my screen share is only showing this one slide. Hmm. While you figure it out, I'll say one more thing about that, <clears throat> about that moment. It It's like, uh, I feel like Christian is a great storyteller already on his own. And there so- yeah, it was fun to just sort of put him in a position to see what what he'd come up with here. And, that, um, and but now that I think about it, isn't it kind of interesting that Milo gets the last word? That was me stalling, Christian. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a thought, but I, like most of them, they just kind of it faded. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, I had one other question I wanted to pose to the two of you. Um, this is a tiny thing, but I loved that when Milo and his sister are boarding the subway, they each have a small black rectangle in their right hands. For Milo, it's his sketchbook. And for his sister, it's her phone. And he'll spend the ride imagining and drawing all that he sees. And she'll spend the ride playing a game and tuning everything out. Um, especially in that moment when Milo holds up his picture to her. and. The quote was, even when she turns to look, Milo can tell she doesn't see. Um, is that something that you've noticed on public transportation or even just in interactions between families, friendships um, that you wanted to kind of look at a little more closely, allow readers to kind of look back on their own experiences? with their families or on public transportation. Can you just talk a little bit about that interaction? Cause I was so taken with it. Do you want to start with the visual Christian? Um, sure. Um, I'll say that, well, first off, my name is Christian Robinson and I'm addicted to looking at my phone and, <laughs> and can spend an entire day just looking at random videos. Um, so I think I was coming at this approaching this from more of an observation than a judgment, mm. right? We all sometimes get lost in the, in the phone, on the screen. Um, but yeah, I think both Milo and his sister, even though they're on, they're on different devices, I think are doing the same thing. They're trying to process something or maybe even try to escape something. Um, and I, and it's kind of scary sometimes the payoff that I maybe get from drawing or illustrating sometimes can't happen when I'm like getting lost in a video that connects some experience that I relate to or um, or someone is yeah and so yeah they're going doing some they're they're going at it from different angles but I think they're both doing a similar thing trying to process this experience that they're they're having on this subway to see their mother um yeah Matt yeah and I think it's just I love that you said this isn't a judgment it's just an observation and and I think that that may be you know where we're coming from with the book is <clears throat> is that maybe our job 
as humans is to be more generous with people. Cause it's, it's so tempting when I'm at the park and I'm watching these kids play and then I, and I'm watching my kids play and then I'm watching all the parents that are on their phones. And, and if they are looking at their kid, they're doing it through a phone to take a picture. It's very tempting to be judgmental. But I think maybe what this, this book that we're, the question maybe we're posing here is that maybe it's just good to be generous with other human beings. We, we, we don't know what they're going through. We don't know if they're reading uh, something about, you know, something that's happening to their sister in another state. I just think, uh, I, I just love the way you said that. And I think part of Milo's journey is to, to maybe be open to the different possibilities. Maybe his, his judgment, snap judgment that's sort of informed by lazy stereotypes, maybe that, that isn't the best way to do it. And we are living in a time, especially for young people, where we're being told to be six feet apart and everybody's wearing a mask at the playground sometimes. And it's even harder to be accurate with your snap judgments because you can't even see the entire face of the, of the person in front of you. So um, yeah, I think we're all on these little individual journeys and maybe Milo is like me and maybe Milo is like Christian in that he's just looking up and making observations. And I think Milo's brave to be open to revising his observations. Well, I think that's a beautiful place for us to end, being generous with each other and just observing, not judging. So thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation. And thank you, Cindy, for having us here today at Book Thanks Fest. so much, Jenny. You were great. Thank you. She was indeed great. Thank you for that beautiful conversation. Um, and you, you must go read Milo Imagines the World. It is just the most lovely picture book.